Uh, Common Room was founded uh, by three people initially. Um, Lars Fisher, myself, Todd Rohe, and my partner, Maria Ibanez. And we started that office when we decided to work on a, on a, on a competition together. Um, we were each working independently on our own projects, and we were actually working in our apartment. Um, but when this larger project came along, it was time for us to find a space to work. And we found a space that was very close to our apartment, uh, which made it you know, feel like we were just sort of moving from one room to another. And we had, we had a, um, a kind of jar that we would drop names into for, the na for our new office. And they accumulated there over several weeks as we were getting ready to move. And when we emptied out the jar and read all the names, they were all terrible. So we didn't use any of those. <laughs> um, and the next day, Lars came in with the, <laughs> with the right name, Common Room. <clears throat> and we founded that as a place where we could each have all of our own individual offices and identities. But when we worked on projects together, then we would be working together. So the aim was um, behind Common Room as a name, but also a concept, is that we could work together or individually, and we could also include other people in the workspace because it was it had sort of a neutral name. It's very different now because um, we we actually work in different countries on different continents. Um, there's an office in Brussels, and it's still the same office in New York. Um, I would say it's similar in that everybody uh, sort of is doing still their own work, but we are also working together, um, and the sort of way we have of working together is similar. Yeah. Also, um, uh, there are there are. Um, three, four, five, six, six, of us six members of Common Room. Uh, only two members ever work in the same space <laughs> unless we're visiting each other. Our graphic designer, who is a member of Common Room um, and does all of the graphics that, you know, some of the things you'll see tonight, including the presentation and our books, um, he's not far away, but he doesn't work in our space. But he's sort of, he's very interested and invested in, you know, how the name and the, and the idea of the space structure are working relationship. So really, the concept is more important than the reality now in terms of how we work. And it sort of still maintains that. Yeah. We have an archive. We have a server. <laughs> no, we have, we have documents. That's true. We have five newspapers, three books. Um, uh, I mean, as literal things that, that document the process, the sort of the, or outcomes of projects. And then we also, in the books, some of the books document th the activities that took place, like the public school for architecture, which you brought with us. Um, and the newspapers document both ideas, activities, and specific events. And um, we do have, a, I mean, that's formally, like those are material things. Uh, the, also, the, the way that, um, that those things occur, uh, that some of the projects we are involved in, uh, our, our meetings, lectures, classes, um, book launches, those are always documented. And we save those to be as sort of part of the whole uh, record of that event. So. We have all of those things that um, exist around all of these projects. Another thing that, I mean, if you mentioned the server. But I don't think we keep them. We keep them with the intention of working with them in the future ourselves. But, I mean, who says what the goal of them? Yeah, I mean, if, at the moment them. you keep them, you just, you know, I don't know what the goal of an archive. I mean, you don't think about. I don't think about it as an archive is all I meant to say. I, yeah, we're not thinking about our legacy. <laughs> but, but we do, but we do know that we need to keep uh, some record of these events, a tangible record, because, and, you'll, and, and we'll, 
if you go online, I don't, I don't know, you know, we can't, I mean, it's hard to sort of explain all of our work right now, but one of the things that, you know, one of the uh, interests of the office is things that aren't necessarily building. Uh, architecture as book, architecture as event. And if it's not going to be a building, it's not going to be something that's, you know, there for any given period of time, then it needs to be documented in another way. And in some ways, that's actually um, encouraged us to collect more material rather than less because these things continue to happen. I mean, I, we have a pretty good <laughs> stock of people doing things. The other thing, well, another thing that's interesting about this, and you can talk about the server now, is that everything we do in our in common room is considered a project. So on our server, um, in any given year, there can be 60 projects. Um, but this lecture is a project in our server. Um, a research for an upcoming book is a, is a project in our server. Um, a competition, obviously, or even a sort of started competition that we ended up, you know, not getting shortlisted for. All of these things are listed as projects, so um, they, they're, equal, they're all equal. There's not a hierarchy between building, book, event, lecture, walking tour, et cetera. So that also encourages you know, a sort of record of almost everything that happens. Yeah? I guess. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> we keep more now because of, we were talking about earlier, our, our way of working now that we work uh, far apart as a uh, few dropouts often and it becomes very a very very iterative process um, so for example writing writing um, a text somebody starts with an outline somebody starts with some quotes somebody starts with you know a reference text and all those go in one folder and then somebody starts with the first version and then you know, the next version. Sometimes. There's lots of versions and of so things. And so by the end of something, you can get to uh, kind of version 30, version 40 for like a three-page article. Yeah. Um, and you know, sometimes it changes between one to the next or only a few. Sometimes somebody starts working on it and uh, somebody else is working at the same time and one gets thrown away. Sometimes somebody kind of yeah. ignores the changes somebody else has made and goes back yeah. to a previous version. Yeah. And in that way, working all those versions have been getting kept, and we haven't been so you necessarily need, we need, throwing them So we need, we need an archivist a, at this point. There's a we need, we need time. We need some time to get to, to weed things out. Anyway. The, the first public school, the, pu the pu public school for architecture is part of a larger network of public schools which is a project that was started by um, Sean Docker uh, out of Telegraph Exchange in Los Angeles. And um, then in 2009, uh, sounds, that sounds good. we started, um, as part of a Van Allen grant, the Public School for Architecture in New York. And that lasted for about three months. And so the public school is an open framework. It's an online platform that um, allows anyone to go online and propose a class. Anyone can offer to teach a class. Um, and there's a volunteer committee that, that organizes the classes by finding spaces, finding teachers if necessary, you know, helping develop ideas. And um, but the classes um, self-generate so through the organization, and the generation is is remote and sort of virtual, but the classes always happen in person at a specific time, at a specific place, with somebody who's agreed to teach the class, which doesn't mean that they're qualified to teach the class. It just means that at least that finally somebody was interested enough in the material to step up, step up and say, okay, we're gonna organize this stuff. Um, and so that lasted for about three months. But I mean, it's architectural only in the sense that it was sort of organized by architects. It's a very um, broad definition of architecture, so what right. gets included. First of all, it's, it's, the idea is that anybody can come to the classes. You don't have to be an architect. You don't have to have any knowledge of architecture to come to the classes. That was our, that was our hope. It ends up that a lot of people in the public thought that maybe they did need to be architects to sign up for classes. That so hasn't that, been true in Brussels. Hasn't been true in Brussels in this, yeah, that's good. Um, so it's, but the United, the, the New York version has now 
uh, been regenerated in Brussels, and so that it's it's different there. Yeah. So that that project ended, and then um, in the spring of 2014, um, we decided to um, start another public school for architecture. This time in Brussels, um, and this one was started as uh, part of our residency at a uh, club, um, which is. Um, an arts organization in Brussels, and it was actually a residency in a train station, an active train station. Um, so it was in the kind of very open public areas of this train station where we would hold classes while with sort of like commuters walking by and people coming in and out while the activities of the train station happening around it. Um, How were the classes? The classes um, were very mixed. Uh, in the kind of initial first eight weeks, which is when the residency was was there, you know, some were better than others, and and sometimes the failures are are more productive than the successes. You know, we had some people come in and give, like, you know, kind of experts come in and give talks or lectures that are sort of more traditional towards what you would expect, except in a different setting. With a different audience, but then we also had uh, some people who just really wanted to teach a class on something they were interested in. So we had a flight attendant teach a class on eco housing techniques. Um, Is that the one with the compostable toilet? No, that's a different. That that's a real group. Um, you know, some some sort of existing groups have come in and used it as an opportunity to give workshops. Um, people often use it as an opportunity to present work that they're still kind of testing out. Right. The, the, because of the way that the platform is set up, um, it could be, so to speak, taken over or somebody can enter with a different agenda than, say, the organizers of the public school, which is allowed to a great extent, unless it's more commercially oriented and then, and then of course, the committee has the ability to try to edit that out, but yeah, so it can, so things can happen there in the public school for architecture, which one aren't architectural, but the sort of context suggests that they should be, they, things can happen there that the committee and other, even other sort of members of the public school really can't control, and um, sometimes, yeah, sometimes those things really work out and sometimes they don't. And not working out is probably, you know, when either Nobody shows up, or, or they like, or it's just sort of like a very typical class, like just you know, teacher, student, absorb, kind of stuff. It's really meant to encourage, to encourage people to talk about things. I think for us also, um, one of the reasons it's an important project to us is to um, explore the boundaries of architectural education, or what, what education in architecture could be, um, what the kind of testing kind of the range of possibilities mm -hmm. outside of the kind of existing institutions of architecture and trying to um, maybe find a place for new or different communities to emerge around ideas um, mm -hmm. of architecture and learning. You can't get a degree from the public school for architecture. You probably yeah, know you that. Absolutely <laughs> not accredited. Uh, you could probably learn a lot. Also, also nobody gets including teachers or the committee, which um, is something that... Um, is up to the committee. It is up to the committee, and it is something complicated, and we understand that. Um, asking, asking people to sort of give classes, um, you know, the idea of working for free is a really big topic right now. One um, thing that we emphasize um, is that the, there isn't a hierarchy or we try and at least kind of um, blur the distinction between teacher and student in the context of the public school. And so we're not paying students to be there. Um, paying students? So we're not gonna charging pay teachers them. to be there. Not charging them. No, we're not them. charging them, but also like uh, everybody <laughs> hopefully, hopefully everybody is getting, getting something out of the kind of interaction that's happening. There's an exchange happening and that exchange goes both ways. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, it's part of it. Could be 
sort of connected to the sharing economy. But I, I'm not sure that it is in, in the way that uh, sort of in the way that the sort of typical benefits or investments pay off for some members of the sharing economy and not others. But it certainly has a it's certainly a version of that, yeah. for better or worse. I'm bringing it up because we get asked that all the time. I'm yeah, yeah, and uh, part of that sharing economy has to do with this, the same as, same thing we often get asked about, a kind of cultural capital or an exchange of cultural capital taking place instead of an exchange of actual monetary value. And I would say that we also don't see it that way, that it is not sort of instead of getting paid, you're getting paid in some kind of like uh, cultural capital value. We try and focus on the actual exchange of what yeah, the con Yeah, the content or how, or how people the how people discuss a topic which might be unfamiliar or might be well known, but at least um, participate in it. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, common room, it doesn't exist as a commercial entity. Um, it doesn't have a bank account. It doesn't actually exist. <laughs> I don't think it, I don't think it even exists. I don't think common room even exists. Um, very touches the ground very lightly. So it is, in that sense, it's a project that everybody who's participating in it sort of agrees to. Um, some things are spelled out more explicitly than others. By things, I mean the way that we might work on a project or what the values would be, or the, again, we all have to agree together um, that a project is truly a common room project is the way we work on it versus something else. Um, there's a project that you know, we worked on in our office this summer, a, a temporary public assembly for the Queen's Night Market, um, which we considered, which we discussed, and it's not a common room project because, partially because the guy organizing the Queen's Night Market already had his whole apparatus together and we couldn't participate with him the way we needed to, but as architects we could facilitate his having the market, which we did. So that wasn't a common room project because it, we, there wasn't enough involvement from all the members, even though maybe some of the, uh, the intent or the sort of inter, the interaction and participa participatory nature of the project might have been there. Um, and we all, like I said, we all do other things besides common room, which... We also don't always agree. About what? Whether something is or is not a common room project, oh, should right. or should not be. Give me an example of something that we didn't agree upon. I'm not going to do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, even some of the projects we work on now, I would say Give. some people have more misgivings than others. <laughs> even some of the projects in the lecture. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's a balance, and that's yeah, that's and right. it's a process. But yeah, there's some projects that we're working on aren't aren't part of that project. Aren't part of that project. And even sometimes we we'll work on and things together outside the, of common. I room. think the reason that again that it's structured that way, and you might get asked this separately. We are asking us collectively together, but we get asked asked uh, by other people, um, you know, individually. Why are the two? Why would I have two offices? not just to, you know, why do we run two offices within our same space? And the reason is that we can explore the things that we want to explore with Common Room. Um, it's, you know, we can, we don't have, we don't, we don't, we don't take projects where, where we would be too limited with uh, what we could propose um, or how we could interact with the client or the organization that hired us. So if that seemed like it was going to be a limitation, then we could say that really wasn't the right project for us and keep that common room project sort of, you know, sort of, you know, on track or sort of exploring things that we're interested in. So it gives us that opportunity. And it also then, you know, the work that we gather through common room or that sort of accumulates is, it has, you know, a sort of a, a strong, sort of a strong direction, direction, purpose. I don't think it has. <clears throat> Cohesive. Uh, and I, it, it sort it of cor it, it corresponds to a certain right. ideology which we all agree upon. Oh, we don't all agree upon, but that an ideology must, that, that we that, that we, we know all, about that we all talk about. Yeah. Yes. Continuously. <clears throat>